My dear brothers and sisters, I'd like to talk in this brief time that we have together about uh, Zion and the spirit of the at one -ment. It needs to flourish in Zion for it to be Zion. And how we get there to that society, to that experience, that social experience, from where we are now. Let me read to you a few reminding words from 4th Nephi. And it came to pass that there was no contention in the land because of the love of God which did dwell in the hearts of the people. And there were no envyings, nor strifes, nor tumults, nor whoredoms, nor lyings, nor murders, nor any manner, manner of lasciviousness. And surely there could not be a happier people among all the people who had been created by the hand of God. They were in one, the children of Christ and heirs to the kingdom of God. And how blessed were they? Well, as I asked, how do we get to the heavenly Zion condition described in 4th Nephi? How do we learn how to live the spirit of the atonement? How do we bridge the gap between where we may perceive ourselves to be spiritually now and where we want to be? and where we need to be as a society. Will the Lord do something magical to make us ready for his coming, to make us ready to build Zion, to enter at last into the kingdom of God? How do we get there from here? Well, I'd like to suggest that we've come to earth to learn the principles of peace and at one moment and to take them with us into the kingdom. Now, we knew them in the pre-mortal world and we lived them there, we experienced them there, we saw how they worked. But we may have forgotten here how they work. Is it possible, in fact, that our very possession of these principles, our very possession of these principles is the evidence of our preparation to enter into the kingdom? When we think how easily we may have traded the spirit of atonement for disturbance, we see what a challenge it might be for us to live in a Zion or heavenly condition where everyone will have learned by desire and practice to prefer the spirit of at one with each other to conflict or disturbance. Now, what is the nature of the negative energy that leads to conflict around us? It is unrest caused perhaps by trying to impose one's own will on others or by criticism or anger or irritability or selfishness or failure to forgive, failure to revere another's agency, retaliation, moodiness, fear, worry, or simply forgetting to have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. All of these we have probably all experimented with to learn bitter and sweet. These are ways we all act, I think, until we learn that there is something better. And the better way is connected with this divine nature that you and I came to earth to get. Of course, we all feel negative emotions sometimes, and sometimes they need to be expressed. But even when these negative energy emotions are fully justified, they can constitute a spiritual burden for ourselves and those around us if they're indulged in too long. Our bad temper and bad moods can become a form of abuse for us and for those around us. Perhaps we have not fully processed the idea that peace is a vital state for the spirit to flourish in we may not have realized the spiritual value of inner peace. The Lord, however, seems to value it highly and often invites us to live in peace. And there are many examples in the Book of Mormon. Mormon, for example, speaks to the peaceable followers of Christ who have entered into the rest of the Lord, whom he recognizes because of their peaceable walk with men. Maybe peace has seemed like something that just happens if we're lucky, or it seems like a luxury that we can sometimes live without. But learning to establish real inner peace is indispensable to spiritual progress. The scriptures 
also call this piece Rest in the Lord, or God's Rest. This rest or peace is a gift of sweet feeling as well as insight from the Lord and cannot be accomplished by just positive thinking alone or by denial of negative feeling. It is a spiritual state initiated by us and follows spiritual principles. For example, the Lord says, teach them never to be weary of good works, but to be meek and lowly in heart, for such shall find rest to their souls. That's Alma 37. Thus, as I have watched myself and others, it is sobering how readily we trade inner peace for something less, for some sort of upset. How readily we take offense and then escalate disturbance around us. How easily we have unsatisfied expectations of how others should treat us or what they should be doing for us, and we grow, grow cold or irritable to retaliate for this real or imagined slight. How eagerly we may insist on being right at the experience of precious relationships, thus keeping the water rippling around us with negative energy, we are often not still and at rest in the principles of tolerance and love, of overlooking, of letting go, of forgiving. I find that when I am not at peace inside, I make trouble around me. I even look for trouble, picking at this, complaining at that, practicing abuse on my loved ones. I may yield to self-pity, which causes me to withdraw, licking my wounds, waiting for someone to fix what is really my responsibility to fix inside myself. I think self-pity may be a sin because it functions to violate the spirit of at one and the power of faith. I have asked myself, how long could I last in Zion? How long would it be before I single-handedly dismantled Zion? Maybe I have thought that the last judgment, someone would wave a magic priesthood wand over me and I would suddenly acquire a heavenly personality. But it's clear to me now that the Lord expects me to practice here and to involve him in these kinds of personal challenges until the heavenly personality becomes mine. A Zion society is the product of the personal choice of every person in it. And yes, it is also a function of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ that shapes hearts to be like his great heart. But first it begins with an individual choice and must become independent of other people's choices for something less. Now, the Spirit of the Lord itself is the Spirit of at one -ment. It flows from the Lord Jesus Christ and seeks to draw us to Him and to each other. He invites us to synchronize our personal energies with His in all our relationships. And as we synchronize our energies, we feel at peace with ourselves, with the Lord, and with each other. You know that you and I have the divine power to generate, by an act of will, positive energy. Mentally, physically, and spiritually, by carefully choosing attitudes, actions, and words, according to the teachings in the scriptures. I have come to know that in any moment, what I send out is my choice, and I can't blame it on a situation or on another person. That personal responsibility is made very clear repeatedly in the Book of Mormon. This is Helaman 14. You'll recognize it. And now remember, remember, my brethren, that whosoever perisheth, perisheth unto himself, and whosoever doeth iniquity, doeth it unto himself. For behold, ye are free. Ye are permitted to act for yourselves. For behold, God hath given unto you a knowledge, and he hath made you free. He hath given unto you that ye might know good from evil, and he hath given unto you that ye might choose life or death. And ye can do good and be restored unto that which is good, or have that which is good restored unto you, or ye can do evil and have that which is evil restored unto you. 
That's a description, one description of many in the Book of Mormon, of the powerful law of restoration. And we'll talk about that more in a minute. But when we do choose to generate positive spiritual energy around us, which we have the power and the agency to do, the Spirit of the Lord is attracted to that positive energy, connects with it, and magnifies its power and influence for good. Thus we learn to work as the Savior works. This is how He worked and to become as he is, even as we walk in this life. This divine power of at one that seeks to work miracles in relationships, to make good relationships eternal, to make poor relationships better, and to pull us together in sweet, resonating relationships. But there are some basic things we apparently have to understand first. We may indeed have many misconceptions about how to be happy and how to establish relationships of at one with others. We may think that these relationships have to meet our own concept of ideal. We may think that people have to feel and think the way we do in order to be happy with them, or that we have to think as they do in order to have the spirit of at one between us. We may feel that many of the people around us do not value what we do, do not meet our hopes and our dreams and we may despair that we will ever experience at one moment with some of the people that God has put into our lives. But I've learned that all the people that are in our lives are there for important reasons. Seldom are they given to us to satisfy us. That was a very important learning for me, is that the people in my life were not given to me to satisfy me necessarily. Rather, they are our teachers, unwittingly most of the time, but they are. We don't need ideal relationships to be happy. Our marriage doesn't have to be ideal. Our parenting doesn't have to be ideal for us all to be happy in those relationships. We can live happily with less than ideal. Obviously, we have to because each relationship can be enriched with the spirit of the at-one-ment, which greatly improves the quality of our personal emotional lives. Now, all of us have experienced or are now experiencing troubled relationships. I know from my own experience that miracles very often happen in relationships. I grew up in what the psychological world calls today a dysfunctional family. Each of the people in that family was and is a good person. They were good people with very little understanding then of how to be happy. In my experience in a troubled family, these are some of the things I learned to do without realizing I was learning them. I learned to try to control other people. I learned to be critical in order to feel more secure in my own self-righteousness. I learned to require satisfaction from others' behavior. I wanted certain responses from people, and if I didn't get them, I was unhappy or angry. I learned to use anger as manipulation. I learned to be very self-assertive, to try to prove myself in every situation. I learned to make trouble by letting people know the various ways in which they were not meeting my expectations. I learned to get even with irritability, with cold silences, or not so subtle barbed words. I learned to nag people and to try to talk them into things, to make them the way I wanted them to be. And these people came to feel like my enemies. The results of this behavior was that I experienced a lot of unfocused fear in my life, tendencies to depression, guilty feelings. I couldn't seem to tact any particular way of acting, feelings of pointlessness or meaninglessness in life. But here is one of the main points I want to make about establishing Zion. I did not see a relationship between the way I treated other people and the way I felt inside. I thought that what they were doing made me unhappy, but it was how I was reacting and what I was doing that made me unhappy. So this principle, much of the emotional pain that we have doesn't come from the love that we weren't given in the past but the love we ourselves aren't giving in the present. That principle could be of so much help to people who've come from a plague of, of abusing families. 
that if they realize that part of getting well has to do with learning how to love now. Nevertheless, here is the reality of telestial living. Nearly every day, someone will do one or more of the following. Belittle us, be insensitive to our needs, show indifference to us, make us feel insecure, humiliate us, frighten us, abuse us, inconvenience us, make demands of us, criticize us, disappoint us, lie to us, hurt us, betray us, try to seduce us, misunderstand us, resent us, threaten us, or attack us verbally or physically. But how are we ever going to learn Christ-like love unless we have a chance to practice in the face of opposites? Every disrupted relationship, whether in our own homes or out in the marketplace, is a chance to forge the divine nature in ourselves and prepare for that endless state of happiness. I'm so grateful that the Lord has put examples of dysfunctional families and relationships into the Book of Mormon. Nephi, for example, who lived with very abusive brothers and experienced many abuses, even the violation of his own person. He received verbal and physical abuse from those who should have been his protectors and his nurturers. A paradox that we see all through our society and much too much even in the church. How very relevant is his experience to so many of us. It appears that on several occasions, though, he was able to forgive them frankly. First Nephi 721 says, and I, Nephi, did frankly forgive them. But by 2 Nephi, chapter 4, he faces the debilitating effects of his brother's behavior on himself. He's angry, only he has turned his anger inward, and it's depressed him. He's in a full-blown state of depression. And anger turned inward is a very common source of depression. He sees, though, as this little psalm progresses in the fourth chapter of 2 Nephi, that although his anger is 100% justified, nevertheless, for his own spiritual well-being, he must let it go and neutralize it somehow, heal it somehow by turning to the Lord. He says, you'll remember, this is after he has said, oh, wretched man that I am. And you know when you're in a depression or when you're very angry with someone, you don't feel good about yourself no matter how justified you may be in your anger. And he's just been talking about how bad he feels in spite of all the wonderful spiritual experience that he's had. And then he says at this sort of pivotal point in his monologue, why should my heart weep and my soul linger in the valley of sorrow and my flesh waste away and my strength slacken because of mine afflictions? And why should I yield to sin because of my flesh? Why am I angry because of my enemy? Awake, my soul, no longer droop in sin. Rejoice, O my heart, and give place no more for the enemy of my soul. Do not anger again. Do not slacken my strength. Rejoice, O my heart, and cry unto the Lord. And then he says to the Lord, Wilt thou make me that I may shake at the appearance of sin? Well, he teaches this powerful principle. We are not judged for what others do to us. We are judged by how we react to what they do to us, based on what we understand at the time. Our happiness is based on what we do now, not so much on what was done to us. Now, we're not talking here about submitting to serious abuse, to serious physical or verbal abuse in families. Those things also require forgiveness, and they also require understanding and compassion. But often it's very important for a person to remove himself or herself from that situation in order to survive. Forgiving people, acting kindly toward them, doesn't necessarily mean letting them abuse us. Sometimes relationships have to be severed to keep one of the parties from being destroyed. In Nephi's case, in fact, the Lord finally took him out of Laman and Lemuel's presence 
It's by Second Nephi chapter 5. He's told to pick up his things and go and find another place to live with his family. But Nephi waited on the Lord, teaching us that revelation is absolutely indispensable to relationship work. When we are in relationship trouble, we need to draw very close to the Lord and counsel with him the best we can. Alma 37, 37, counsel with the Lord and all of your doings. Even if we do not think of ourselves as spiritually adept, and I think often when we're in emotionally troubled circumstances and in troubled relationships, we do not feel spiritually capable. The Book of Mormon teaches us over and over again, understanding that we may feel inadequate spiritually, that if we will just come to the Lord Jesus Christ in humility, he can take even our worst messes, even the ones we ourselves have made, and make them work to our benefit and healing and blessing. Alma said to his son Shiblon, and this principle is so precious when we really process it and believe it. And now, my son, I would that you should remember that as much as you shall put your trust in God, even so much ye shall be delivered out of your trials and your troubles and your afflictions and ye shall be lifted up at the last day. That's Alma 38, 5. I love this relationship he sets up, that to the degree that you trust God, to that degree he will deliver you. So the greater our trust, the more complete the deliverance, whatever form that deliverance needs to take. I would like to inject uh, one additional idea here. What we cannot know nor remember until the Lord reveals it is what we covenanted to do in the pre-mortal world with respect to a particular relationship here. It's clear that in the pre-mortal world many of us entered into relationships which the Lord through his power reformed again here on the earth. We do not remember what the nature of those relationships was in the pre-mortal world. Many of your patriarchal blessings may refer to the fact that you were born into families that you chose to be born into because of relationships developed in the pre-mortal world. There, I have family members who have that. Some of my children have reference to that and their blessings. So that perhaps even in the pre-mortal world we covenanted even to make certain sacrifices in order to be with certain people in this world that would be not easy for us to be with. But from them, we would learn. And from trying to work out our problems with them, we would learn the very things that we most needed to learn in this mortal experience. In some cases, the Lord will take us out of a relationship or counsel us to take ourselves out. But very often, he will set about to work a small series of miracles in the relationship so that the spirit of at one that can flourish in us and with us as it does in heaven. He's trying to teach us to live in a celestial society and to master the principles that govern such a society. Therefore, it seems that usually he wants us to mend rather than sever relationships. But each experience has its learnings, and when we depend on him and cleave to him, he will lead all who are willing out of the mess, the wiser for having been through the experience. I'd like to talk about the word at one moment, since we've been using it so much. The word at one moment comes into, as many of you may know, comes into the English language in the 15th and 16th centuries when early translators like William Tyndall and Wycliffe and so on, were translating the ancient scriptures into the English language. As they came across the word reconcile or other such words, words which could be translated reconcile, they made up a word. Instead of using the word reconcile, which they did in some places, they used the word to at one something, to bring estranged and alienated things into a state of at one moment, meshing with each other, reconciliation with each other. It doesn't have a Greek root, it doesn't have a Latin root, and 
the word really means to bring things into a state of at-one-ment so that when Christ wrought the great at-one-ment it was to bring that which was fallen and alienated and scattered and spiritually dead and miserable out of that condition back into a relationship like those people had in the pre-mortal world scriptures even the Book of Mormon talk again and again about restoring us to that relationship with God. The implication being that we had it before we came with each other and with Him. Now, at one minute in Hebrew, the word underneath that is kafar kippur, as in the uh, word yom kippur, the day of atonement. Kafar, as uh, Brother Nibley tells us in Approaching Zion, page 556, if you'd like to read a fuller discussion of it means to forgive, to cover, or to have a close embrace with, as related to our word kaftan, where a kaftan, you know, it, it fully encircles or embraces the body. The image of the atonement is the being encircled in or by something. For example, being encircled in the arms of the Lord. The idea of embrace is inseparably tied to the idea of atonement and should lead us to think perhaps about the temple as well, where the great at one moment is wrought as we progressively seal ourselves to the Lord Jesus Christ. Many Book of Mormon passages speak of being embraced or encircled in the arms of the Lord. This is the great image then of atonement or at one moment. Second Nephi 1 and 15. The Lord hath redeemed my soul from hell. I have beheld his glory, and I am encircled about eternally in the arms of his love. It's Lehi speaking. Alma 5 and 33. Behold, he sendeth an invitation unto all men, for the arms of mercy are extended towards them, and he saith, Repent, and I will receive you. Now these can be multiplied many times. At one moment is clearly another word for sealing. There is no ultimate embrace without obedience to temple ordinances of sealing, of endowment, of temple marriage. I think how marriage itself is such a beautiful example of at one moment. Adam says, this I now know is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. Cleave and one are at one moment. The Holy of Holies in the temple is called in Hebrew the Beit HaKaporet, the house or room of the embrace or the at one moment, the place where the presence of God is. Now the concept of at one moment, bringing things that are dead, strange, scattered together into one is a concept that permeates all of our scripture. If you haven't noticed it, you may notice it more. The Savior says in John, If I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. Third Nephi 27, actually, he says that. So it means to bring, as I said before, alienated, miserable, fallen beings back into harmony and life and resonance with each other and with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the Lord also seems to want us to understand that it is possible to have a stay of at one moment now. He says in the Doctrine and Covenants, things must be done on earth as they are done in heaven, so that that which is earthly, I'm sorry, I'm not quoting the Lord there, I'm quoting myself. Things must be done on earth as they are done in heaven, so that that which is earthly may be made heavenly. That which does not try to be heavenly that which does not try to be heavenly must remain telestial or terrestrial and cannot be made heavenly or celestial. Now, a one moment then is the condition in which heavenly beings live. If we want to live there with them, we have to practice here and now the manner of emotional and spiritual life that they live and that they teach us to live. This life, Amulek says, is the time for men to prepare to meet God. Alma 34, 32. So we want to think through how to live the spirit of at one moment and bring it to pass in whatever way we can on the earth. 
You might refer to Doctrine and Covenants 2713, where the Lord says, I have committed the keys of my kingdom and a dispensation of the gospel for the last times and for the fullness of time, in the which, he says, I will gather together in one all things, both which are in heaven and which are on earth. And things seems to be mostly people. In this dispensation, the Lord has said, speaking about the saints, but behold, they, the saints, have not learned to be obedient to the things which I required at their hands, and do not impart of their substance as become a saints to the poor and afflicted among them, and are not united according to the union required by the law of the celestial kingdom. And then he says so powerfully, And Zion cannot be built up unless it is by the principles of the law of the celestial kingdom. That's Doctrine and Covenants 105 and 3. Now, if you think about it, one work in the church, you can see it taking place at so many levels. Our missionaries go out to bring that which is scattered and alienated back into oneness, into Zion communities. We do the same thing with our visiting and our home teaching. We go to the temple and we seal our families into at one moment chains. Uh, we, men and women come and are at one or sealed in the temple through the power of of the Lord Jesus Christ. There are so many scripture words for it, one minute. There's oneness, in one, unity, united, order, united order, gathering, equal, cleaving, sealing, welding, linking, embracing, even resurrection itself is an at one minute word to bringing the body and the spirit back into a permanent state of oneness. What is the temple endowment, as I said earlier, itself, but a progressive sealing of ourselves to the Lord until we are clasped in the arms of Jesus? In the temple, in fact, the effectiveness of special prayer is absolutely facilitated by feelings of love. So then we see that atonement work or at one moment work is temporal, emotional, and spiritual. And the more we engage in it, the more we establish the spirit of Zion. As we grow spiritually, our feeling about life is influenced by how we act and even feel toward others. That is, we truly reap what we send out. Alma 41 and 15 is one of the best statements of this law of restoration. And there are several verses which precede it, but this particular one is sort of the punchline. For that which ye do send out shall return unto you again and be restored unto you. So it's a kind of a boomerang effect. And maybe this teaches us that if we don't like what we're getting out of a particular close relationship, we may have to check what it is we are sending into that relationship. Now we probably also have to realize at some point that thoughts and feelings do have energy of their own and they travel from their origin to affect things outside people, to affect people and things outside the originator. But mostly they affect the person with whom they originated. Thoughts are probably a rudimentary form of the power of creation, which you and I will have in the hereafter. The more we are able to control and discipline our thinking here, as the scriptures speak a good deal about, uh, the greater power we will have to create the things we want around us. Now what happens to us enters our systems as energy and takes effect through our energy systems and does affect us what enters into us. But what we send out in response seems to have a much more powerful effect on us. For example, perhaps someone trespasses against me and I feel this negative ripple through my system and I face the moment of decision. Are you consciously aware of that moment of decision when you try to decide how it is you're going to deal with what somebody has just done to you? You either have the power to neutralize the assault on you and return love for what happened, or to let it pass out of you in intensified negative waves, just increasing the bad situation. My happiness, my possession of the Lord's Spirit depends on what I decide among many options to do. And the Lord talks about this in Doctrine and Covenants 64 and says, My disciples in days of old sought occasion against one another and forgave not one another in their hearts. And for this evil they were afflicted and sorely chastened. 
just by the law of restoration, I suppose, as they were afflicting each other and vying for positions of power in the quorum, the law of restoration afflicted them, and they felt chastened. Wherefore I say unto you that ye ought to forgive one another, for he that forgiveth not his brother his trespasses standeth condemned before the Lord, for there remaineth in him the what? The greater sin. I, the Lord, will forgive whom I will forgive, but of you it is required to forgive all men. You know, this really diminishes the size of responsibility that you and I carry around. We don't have to judge other people. We don't have to get vengeance for what they do. We don't have to teach them a lesson. The Lord hasn't given us any of the power to do this. He's asked us to forgive and to return love insofar as the situation allows us to do. Now, the Lord does not mean that we do not take legal steps where necessary. And he goes on in Doctrine Covenant 64 about that. When behavior endangers membership in the church or breaks civil law, it must come to justice for its good and for the good of the people around it. But this giving love where no love is deserved is one meaning in the scriptures of this phrase that shows up again, but which is never fully explained in the scripture, as far as I know, this idea of grace for grace. And it's a significant key to living the spirit of the at one -ment. In Helaman 12, 24, prophet is speaking, and he says, And my God grant in his great fullness that men might be brought unto repentance and good works, that they might be restored unto grace for grace, according to their works. I'm going to add to that Doctrine and Covenants 93, 12, 13, and 20, which uses the phrase again, I, John, saw that he received not of the fullness of the first, but received, and speaking of Christ, grace for grace. And he received not of the fullness at first, but continued from grace to grace until he received a fullness. And then the Lord says to us, For if you keep my commandments, you shall receive of his fullness and be glorified in me as I am in the Father. Therefore I say unto you, you shall receive grace for grace. That is, the Father gave Jesus grace for the grace that he's given us. Divine power or blessings, insofar as he was capable of blessing us. For the, for the grace, well, let, let me start again. That is, the Father gave Jesus grace for the grace that Jesus gave us. Christ gives us grace, divine power and blessings, for the grace that we give others. That is, if we're going to learn to be like Christ, we must learn how to do what he does. He gives grace to us. Totally, in most cases, as King Benjamin would say, unearned by us. Thus, how precious are all our opportunities to give unearned kindness and blessing to those around us. And thus we understand the mind and the nature of the Lord Jesus Christ. You can see how the, the law of restoration is really a form of this law of grace for grace. We give out grace and there's restored grace to us by which we grow and enlarge in the divine nature and in the feelings of wholeness and health and richness in our own lives. For example, by way of application, what would happen if we dropped all charges against those around us? This is a quote from Terry Warner. If for their sake we happily sacrificed all bitter satisfaction, all retribution, all demand for repayment, all vengeance, we let all this go without regret or second thoughts. This kind of behavior, living in the wanting forgiving mode, is a real kindness to ourselves. Now, what are the effects on myself of generating this positive energy? It's becoming clear to me, and I think it's mostly from the Book of Mormon, that there Book of Mormon contains a series of spiritual principles and laws. And that we are either the victims of those laws 
or we are able to make those laws work for us. And the more principles and laws we identify, and the more we may work for us, make work for us, the more we accomplish the purposes for which we came to earth. That is to learn how God works and to work as he does. The law of restoration is one of those laws. You know, we have the power to make that work for us every time we open our mouth, even every time we think every time we act. What I like about this power to generate positive energy is that I can make the law of restoration work for me and I can give it nothing to use against me. That is if I were able to live perfectly. But fortunately the law of repentance makes it possible to cancel those things that you're not able to do perfectly. The second thing I have noticed about practicing this positive energy is that it gives me confidence in the Lord when I pray. Because I guess I feel a sense of the Lord giving me grace for having given grace. I can pray with more faith when I'm actively trying to generate positive energy in the relationships of the people around me. And there's a third benefit. There are probably many, but one that I've, ident I've identified. That instead of making me feel as though I'm a victim of what people do to me, or a victim in my environment, gives me a sense of righteous dominion over my environment. That is, I can use my love and my faith and the gift of the Holy Spirit, which is mine, given to me by priesthood authority, to choose who I want to be, what I want to be, and how I want to act, and have an influence for good on those around me. Joseph Smith said some wonderful things about this. He said, it is by union of feeling that we obtain power with God. And every husband and wife knows that. Every missionary companion knows that. Um, there are just ways which when we pool this positive energy, letting go our own personal ego agendas, and being much more interested in that meshing with each other for higher purposes that we realize that we do tap a power of God. The prophet said, nothing is so much calculated to lead people to forsake sin as to take them by the hand and watch over them with tenderness. When persons manifest the least kindness and love to me, oh, what power it has over my mind. While the opposite course has a tendency to harrow up all the harsh feelings and depress the human mind. Then he says it is the doctrine of the devil to retard the human mind and retard our progress by filling us with self-righteousness. The nearer we get to our Heavenly Father, the more we are disposed, he says, to look with compassion on perishing souls, to take them upon our shoulders and cast their sins behind our back. If you would have mercy on, if you would have God have mercy on you, have mercy on one another. So in any encounter with any person, I can generate the spirit of the at one -ment through listening to him or her with empathy, through encouragement, through feeling for the spirit of the Lord and invoking that spirit in my own mind. I can influence the atmosphere I live in. But then there's a little additional principle I want to add that I won't speak on long, and that is the concept of divine independence. That is, people are in some family relationships bound together in bonds of anguish, not bonds of love, because they do not realize where their responsibility ends. That is, I am not responsible for what any other person does whether it's my husband or my children or anybody around me. The Lord will not hold me responsible if I'm doing what's right for what they do. Therefore, why do I hold myself responsible? It's such a blessing to be able to detach from another person whose behavior you do not like or are afraid of even and not feel responsible for it. We often connect in the wrong ways because we feel responsible for each other, but we're not. 
One who wishes to enter into at one moment first learns a special detachment from others. This detachment produces inner serenity, which is built based on understanding this truth. I am not responsible for what any other human being chooses to do, no matter how many mistakes I may have made with that person. God only holds me responsible for what I do, not for what my children or my husband or my neighbor does. I am liberated by this truth. I can stand independent in the sphere in which I was created to act and not to be acted upon. That's all I'll say about that. But in closing then, if we absolutely knew that the Lord would send His Spirit any time that we began to generate positive feeling with thoughts, words, actions, why would we ever choose to generate something else? Would it be an overstatement, and I'm just really asking this question, to say that during our waking hours we are either generating negative or positive energy? I don't know if there's something in between. God works through positive feelings, which we have the agency and power to generate and multiply. His presence and spirit are attracted to the positive energy that we generate. They are repelled by the opposites. But again, this personal responsibility, God can't practice it for us. We have to practice it ourselves. And so he says, strengthen your brethren in all your conversation, in all your prayers, in all your exhortations, and in all your doings. That's Doctrine and Covenants 18. After I'd shared some of this material with another group one time, a woman came up afterwards and said to me, there's something missing in the material that you have just presented. And if you're going to continue to present this to people, you need to have this additional idea. She says that she knows a woman in, who has an air of marvelous, rich serenity about her. And many people have asked this woman, how is it that you're able to have this, this wonderful air about you? And she said that it went back to an experience she had when she was 16 years old and living in a very, very troubled family, a family in which there was alcoholism and other kinds of abuse. And at 16, she was bound in bonds of anguish to the members of her family. She was trying so hard to make peace in this family. She was trying so hard to keep bad things from happening. She felt so responsible for what everybody in the family was doing and was just turning herself inside out, trying to head people off, manipulate things so they'd be peaceful, uh, not tell, lie, other kinds of things to try to keep this superficial peace going in the family. But it seemed like no matter what she did, it didn't matter. Everybody was colluding against her. She got very, very sick, scarlet fever, something like that, and had one of these after-death experiences, life-after-death experiences. And she said that in that experience, the Savior said to her that she was not responsible for what her mother or her father or her sisters or her brothers did, that he only wanted her to take care of herself, to pay attention to her own lessons, and that she could love and she could offer to those around her, but not to be filled with anxiety and despair when the people around her didn't respond the way she wanted them to, but in a sense to leave them to the Lord and get on to the business of living her own life according to the principles that the Lord had taught her. This was because it was a spiritual experience, tremendously liberating for her. So that even though the Lord does want us to form relationships with one another that are resonant and sweet, there's a part of us inside that remains independent of what others choose to do. Otherwise, we grieve too much over things that we have no power to change. That alienates us from the Lord and decreases the blessing in our lives. Every parent knows the grief over a child that may not be doing what he or she wants. Ultimately, so that grief doesn't tyrannize us and keep us from the Spirit of the Lord, we have to let that child go after we've done all we can do and 
let the Lord be the Savior for that child, which he has promised and covenanted to do. So, to finish, when we live in patience and love with each other, in peace, meshing with those around us, not resisting, but supporting and forgiving each other, speaking the words that evoke the Spirit, encouraging the positive that is in every person we know, no matter what his weaknesses, we live the spirit of at-one-ment with each other. The more we make each relationship sweeter and more tender and dear, the more we live at-one-ment. The more we lay down pride and old checklists of hurts and grievances, the more we send out healing, the more our relationships heal. You know, we have to practice at-one-ment so that we will know how to act should we make it into heaven. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. Now, you have sat very patiently, very still, very long. Is there anything that you would like to contribute or ask or say now? Yes. One point that comes to my mind. You mentioned the desirability of people foregoing feelings of retribution and so on. My mind focuses currently on Bosnia, which is being torn apart by ancient animosities and desires for revenge that are just destroying an entire civilization over there. How different it could be tomorrow morning if they could simply adopt that one gospel principle. It's sobering how just such a little principle can become a worldwide conflict. And it starts from just little bitty beginnings. Somebody's saying, I'm not going to let him get by with that, and there we are. Yes. Thank you. Please. The greatest service we can do someone else is change ourselves. And in changing ourselves, we then help them just automatically. I think you've really uh, touched on something really important. Sometimes in a family or group, one person can be looking at everybody else and saying, they will never change, they will never change, this is hopeless, I'm so filled with despair over the agony that we all live in together. And then this one person who sees all this agony begins to make changes in her own life. And it's as though you've, you've pushed a new button of some kind. Then it begins to have a healing effect through everybody, as though we're all linked in behavior patterns, and if one person begins to change those patterns, then everybody feels free to begin to change patterns that we thought were set in cement. Thank you. Mm -hmm.